Carolina. Thank you, Madam President. I, I appreciate the, uh, the words of my colleague from uh, South Carolina. I fully support everything he said, and I want to come up and speak again to the challenge that we have at the border and why we need to take action now and why that action needs to be taken as part of a supplemental that includes funding for Israel and Ukraine. The, uh, the situation at the border has simply gotten out of control, but I think it bears repeating, it's been said by some of the, uh, the folks who spoke before, we're talking about a four-fold increase. Donald Trump was president for four years. President Biden's been president for three years. And in three years, we have nearly four times the crossings that we did in the Trump administration. Now, let's say some of that's because we had Title 42 and COVID. That's fine. We can argue that. But we can still recognize this is a two or three time increase in illegal crossings. Now, we've lost operational control of the border. We don't have situational awareness at the border. Let me explain what that means. When you have one and a half million people that we know came into this country illegally, they paid money to a cartel, five to $50,000, depending upon what country they came from, to get in this country illegally. But some of them specifically want to go through a sector that the cartels specialize in making sure that you never have to encounter a border agent. They're called gotaways. Over the last three years, one and a half million gotaways have entered this country. Now, I've been to the border several times. It is not, it, once you cross the Rio Grande River, most people are going to go present themselves to a border patrol agent. And then you're going to be processed. You're either going to get screened for asylum or you're going to get paroled. But from the time you cross the border to the time you're released into the United States, it's a matter of days or a week. So why would somebody spend money? Why would one and a half million people spend money to expressly avoid being detained? Unless they've got a bad record, unless they have criminal intent or malign intent. Ladies and gentlemen, we have captured or apprehended people at the border who are on the terrorist watch list. Now, so we've lost operational control of the border by a fourfold increase in crossings. We've lost situational awareness because we don't know where these one and a half million people are. We only know that they set foot on American soil and it's highly unlikely that they went back. Now, I, I, I hate to almost draw this parallel, but I think it's important. One of the things when Israel is able to, uh, to, to be successful in their response to Hamas, Israel's going to have to go back and say, how did this even happen on October the 7th? Well, we know, and I think a part of that analysis is going to be that they had lost situational awareness on the threat coming from Gaza. Now, people may say it's an unfair comparison. I don't think it is. When we have almost 8 million people by the end of this administration here illegally, is it fair to say that a few of them hate America, that they could be terrorists, they are on the terrorist watch list? There is a compelling homeland security reason for securing the border. And the American people agree. I want to get quickly to the negotiations that are being led by James Langford. The American people now, a majority, we're not talking a plurality, we're talking about a majority of Americans' people. Democrats, independents, Republicans agree that we have a major problem or a crisis at the border. Biden needs to fix this problem. Biden needs to fix this problem for senators that are running up. This, this is not a situation where it's just Republicans saying, we want a secure border. We always do, we always will. This is now the American people in the electorate saying that we need to fix it. So when we get into negotiations, of course we've got to change asylum policy, and of course we've got to change parole policy, and of course that's going to make some Democrats get out of their comfort zone. The last thing I'll leave you with, in the last Congress, ladies and gentlemen, I participated in every single bipartisan bill that was passed out of the Congress in the last Congress. I took a lot of heat from the right for doing that, and I did it for good reason. Now, the Democrats can say that they had a, a, a bipartisan vote in the last Congress, but they didn't. All 50 of them voted for something that I worked hard, or 51, voted for something that I worked hard to get 11 or 12 or 15 Republicans to vote on. So now it's time for Democrats to demonstrate their commitment to bipartisanship. It's time to let some of their members get out of, uh, uh, get out of their comfort zone or vote no on the supplemental, while the other ones who recognize this is a problem and that the American people 
have disapproved of this administration's handling of it. Now it's their time to be bipartisan. Now it's their time to recognize that parole reform and asylum reform is critical to reducing the future flows. And I hope that my colleagues will. Because as someone who's tried to be bipartisan and respectful to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I have no intention of supporting a supplemental bill that doesn't have meaningful bipartisan border security that we can measure on an almost immediate basis in terms of reducing the future flows. So Madam President, I hope that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that I thoroughly enjoyed working with on bipartisan efforts in the last Congress will see that this is an opportunity, this is their time to demonstrate the same courage to get out of their comfort zone and do what's right for the American people. I yield the floor. Madam President, I ask